come on stage to any uh, music. Uh, and so that was awesome. Thank you. Um, so I'm Mike Volpe. I've done marketing. I love talking to marketers. How many of you are marketers in this room? I know it's kind of a mix. Okay. Awesome. I love it. My people. Uh, this is exciting. <laughs> Uh, okay, you're in trouble, whoever that was. Um, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and I don't have a ton of time because we have so much awesome content that they've packed in here today at Hypergrowth. Um, so we're going to go through as fast as we can. Make sense? You guys ready? Is this going to be fun? Cool. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, the type of people that you want to hire for your marketing team. Um, and I think there's a couple things here that I really like to look for. The first thing is people that are motivated by metrics. You guys know um, when you watch the Olympics, by the way, I end, I'm going to tell a little weird story now. Dave Gerhardt's going to be like, why the fuck are you going off script, dude? But it's kind of funny, I think. So uh, Gerhardt calls me. Actually, no one calls anymore, so he messages me, right, because everyone messages now. And he's like, hey, Volpe, we're putting together this event. Like, will you come speak? And I said, yeah. Um, but then I told him, I was like, make sure to put me right before the five-time Olympic gold medalist so that everyone will pay attention to what I say. No, not at all. You guys are definitely um, looking forward to the future speakers. What a great lineup they have here. So in any event, so people that are motivated by metrics. And remember when you watch the Olympics and you're like swimming is a good example. There's like a, a yellow line that they put that's like the current like gold medal winning pace or like the world record pace. And you see the people in the pool and they're swimming. The only thing that sucks about that for the swimmers is that they can't see where the line is, right? But guess what? In business, you can see where the line is because you can have charts and metrics and everything that show you what, what the goal pace is that you have. And so I love to find people during the interview process that are motivated by those metrics and they want to wake up every single day being like, oh, we need to be generating this many of you know, these conversations or this many opportunities or this many leads or this many people registered for our events, whatever it is and wake up every day and say, oh, I'm like five off pace. What can I do to catch up? Those, that's the motivation you really want people, and you want people focused on that. And I'm looking at Meg from my team in the back, and she knows that we email these charts out every single day. The second thing that I like to look for are people that are analytical truth seekers. So the trouble in marketing is that oftentimes if it's done poorly, you can hide behind, well, we're trying to do this thing, and you know, here's the vision of what we're doing, and here's the story that we're telling. And even for things that are on the brand, there are things that you can do to dive in and really find the truth. You can you know, interview customers, get closer to your customers, do focus groups, do surveys. And then on the demand generation side, there's obviously a ton of things you can do as well. So I like to find people that don't like to make assumptions. They like to dive in. They're these analytical truth seekers. Coachable. This is hugely important. I think the best people in business are lifelong learners and are willing to be coached by peers, willing to be coached by people that work for them. I'm constantly learning. As I become like older and older, I'm not really in touch with like the newest stuff now. I'm learning things from my team all the time. So people that are coachable, always willing to learn, things like that. I like to ask people what books they've read recently, what podcasts they listen to besides Seeking Wisdom, um, what, what conferences they go to besides Hypergrowth, where are they learning from, who do they look up to, things like that. What were new things that they had to learn? Uh, and so those two things sort of go together. So can you give somebody feedback and they re react to it? And are they a lifelong learner? Are they always trying to learn things? Now, this brings us to the classic example of should you hire generalists or specialists? And I think the um, conventional wisdom on this one is that small companies like startups should hire what? Generalists, right? And big companies, you're ready to go public, you went public, you're bigger companies, you should hire. Guess what? They're both wrong. Both wrong. Here's what you really need to hire. I like people that are both because I'm picky and I'm demanding. And so you can hire people that are what are called T-shaped people. This is an example from the employee handbook from a video game company called Valve, which is an awesome, you can Google it, it's an awesome employee handbook. Uh, in the notes on this slide is a link to it. And obviously this is like, you know, about video gaming, so heavy weaponry is this person's deep specialization, and killing pe people in Russian folk dancing, and sandwich preparation are some of their broad skills. But the point here is that for any role, marketing, sales, whatever it is, there's a, a breadth that people have. Do they know a little bit about everything? That's a good thing. That actually makes it, in my mind, you have more of an ability to be able to more easily work with other people within your company. But do you have some depth? Like, is there a deep area where you are like a world's expert on? I like to find that in people, too. I feel like if you're all breadth and no depth, then you have trouble really contributing a lot to the company. 
If you're all depth and no breadth, a lot of times you have trouble working with other people in the company because you can't figure out how to interface with them. You don't know enough about what they're up to to be able to make that work. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Now, where do you find these awesome people that are lifelong learners? They're coachable. They have T-shaped skills. Where do you find them? Um, there's three basically places that I like to look for to find great marketers. One is you will get some inbound applications. So I like to have, obviously, jobs posted on my own website. That's a good place to find people. What is typically, in my experience, not a good place to find people, and I don't even bother to have jobs posted there, are like job boards, because there's all these people that go just to job boards and apply for 20,000 jobs, not thinking about which company it is or what the role is. They're sort of spamming people. So your own website can be good. Um, referrals, another great, great place to find people. Uh, and so uh, we'll talk about referrals more in a minute. And then there's a bunch of outbound stuff you can do for recruiting, too. We're going to talk about that, too. All right. So inbound, my real recommendation here is have a lot of information, not just about the jobs. Most people focus on the jobs, but have information about the company, what it's really like to work there. And be a little careful. I'm actually like one of these videos, I think it's a picture of, yeah, two people with like beers in front of a foosball table. I actually think there's an interesting opportunity now to go like anti on a lot of this stuff and really focus on the reason you're at work is like because it's hard fucking work and you get to learn something and accomplish something. And not that you can't also have fun, but the fun should not be the primary purpose. So in any event, I'm going to sort of critique my own videos here. But we have a lot of information about the company, what it's like to work there, what type of people do well there, things like that. That's pretty um, standard. I'm going to go back one here. OK, so now referrals. This is by far, in my opinion, the most important source. And a lot of people say, OK, yeah, well, we have a referral program, right? So we give employees a bunch of cash, you know, 1000 bucks or 2000 bucks or more if they refer somebody that we hire. That's nice, but that's like the baby steps of a referral program. So there's a lot of things that you can do to help stimulate more referrals. The first thing that I think you should do is constantly ask employees for referrals specifically, not like put a poster up and be like, hey, do you have any referrals? But ask individual employees. So I usually make a point in my calendar, once somebody's been on board for 90 or 100 days, to like reach out to them and say, hey, you've been here for a few months. Who are the smartest people you've ever worked with? Right? Who do you, now that you really know the company well, who do you know in your network that should be working here? Right? Ask them to think about that as a question. A lot of times we don't do that. We just sort of generally ask the whole company for, for referrals. The other thing I uh, like to do is even go into LinkedIn, find people that I think are good, find who in my company is connected to them, and then ask them specifically, like, OK, for this person, for Mary Smith, you know Mary Smith. It says on LinkedIn that you do. Maybe you don't, but you probably do. right? And should she be working at our company? Should we reach out to her? What should we be doing there? That's like another level. So you really need to almost like dig deep and kind of combine referral with a little bit of outbound activity and some sourcing activity. The other thing that I think works really well is tracking it publicly. So this is a photo uh, on the right here from a company called, uh, on the bottom there, from a company called Segment. They have this thing called a referral tree. And they start with like the founders on the side there. And then it follows all the way through with like the people that the founders knew they could hire in the company, the people that those people knew, and it sort of branches out from there. The genius thing about this is everyone walks by it every single day. It's dynamic, so new employees get added as they get hired. And guess what? It plants that seed in everyone's single head, everyone's head that like our job is to hire more awesome people at the company, and that's the job of everyone here. And people can kind of have a little bit of bragging rights because you know, oh, I've hired I've referred six people, right? So there's a little bit of a leaderboard mentality to it too. So I think that's great. Um, but you, there's so much more that people can be doing with referrals, typically. All right, now, outbound sourcing. It's a little weird for me to be talking about outbound here, but I'm going to do that. Um, so the thing about outbound is you just basically need to have a mentality where you are just always hiring, always looking for good people. So since I've walked in here, I've had a bunch of conversations with all sorts of people. And frankly, every single one of them, in the back of my head, a tiny bit, except for the Drift employees cancel. I would never hire anybody from Drift. Um, but except for those, every single one, I've been thinking, like, should I hire them? Like, how, would they fit into my team well? What's their superpower? Where's their depth in their T-shaped skills? Like, would they fit into my team well? And if you have that sort of mentality, then you're basically always just always looking for new people. Then you can augment that 
with a little bit of activity. Certainly, hopping on LinkedIn and searching for people, I'll sometimes, rather than just like randomly browsing through like news articles and things like that that can be depressing, I'll randomly browse through LinkedIn, put in some different search terms, see who pops up, see who they're connected to. Sometimes get lost there like on a Friday afternoon for an hour, but then I'll usually come up with like four or five interesting leads of people that I might want to meet or talk to. I also do some other things where I try to have like networking events where maybe I'll start with a seed of like six or eight people and then ask each of them to bring three or four people they think are really smart. So that's a great way to get to know more people in a specific niche um, that are really good. I try to stay well connected to people that I used to work with. There's a whole bunch of things you can do there to make sure you're building a strong network of people that are hireable and are sort of in that skill area expertise. Um, and not in, in addition to just every time you meet somebody thinking about it. The other thing I do when it comes to sourcing and hiring people is you always have to play the long game. Because with hiring, one of the biggest things is timing, right? How many times have you bumped into someone that's working at a company like, wow, that sounds like an awesome opportunity, but just right now is the wrong time for me, right? Happens all the time. So um, I always play the long game. This is an example of a woman who's on my team now. Her name's Veronica. And uh, and you try to hire her, I will kill you. Um, <laughs> But she's fantastic. I met her first in 2014 in New York City because I was on Bloomberg TV. I was on this panel, and there were two other panelists, and we were talking about, I don't know, internet marketing or something or whatever. It was just like Bloomberg TV, and the, one of the other panelists was the CEO that she worked for. She, was, she had like a head of communications and then was actually a chief of staff after that. And I'm down there, and I'm like all alone, sweating my ass off, like, oh, Bloomberg TV, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna sound like an idiot, like, what do I do? And she's there, and she's like coaching the shit out of her CEO, and then she's like, okay, here's some cold water, now I got some stuff to do, and I'm like, where the fuck is she going? <laughs> and she's like in the back, she's getting like slowly like kicked out by Bloomberg, and they're putting her like back in the green room, and she's like leaving again, and like going whatever, and I finally figured out, she's like working her way to find all the producers at Bloomberg, and asking them, what are their upcoming segments, like can she get her CEO on those segments, she's just like working like the whole company, because she basically like snuck her way in. And I was like, this is awesome, I wanna hire her. Right? And so I tried to hire her back then, and at the timing was just wrong for her. I tried to hire her again, like a year later, the timing was also wrong for her. But guess what? Like finally, like three years later, it worked out. So I have a list of people that are sort of on my, like I would love to work with them at some point in my life list. Um, some I've worked with before, some I haven't had the opportunity to do so yet, and I'm just always trying to figure out what is the right timing for them. Uh, and you basically need to track these people, because what happened most recently is there was a leadership change in her company. And that was what opened up the timing for her. But for everybody, it's something different. Cool. All right. Now, interviewing. Um, I've got two sample interview questions that I like to ask people. The first is I just ask them, because I'm a marketer, I ask them about the funnel. And usually what I do is just draw up on a whiteboard or a piece of paper or something like that, like some numbers that represent kind of a basic average funnel. And I just ask them, I tell them, like, okay, you're in charge of marketing. Like, what do you do? Where do you focus? What do you, where do you spend your time? Uh, and this usually yields a really interesting conversation around where they like to focus on, how analytical they are. I like to see people sort of break down the different stages of the funnel and look at conversion rates and have an understanding of like how all the stages connect to each other. I like to see people willing to have some amount of depth of like, okay, well, maybe the conversion rate from you know MQLs to opportunities in this particular funnel is maybe a little off. Well, what would you do to fix it? How would that affect other things in the funnel? What would, you know, what would sales' reaction be to that? What would the product team's reaction be to that other thing that you might want to do? Uh, just get a sense of people if they have a, 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 a sense of like how the whole funnel ties together is basically what I like to do. There's kind of an extra special level here too if people sort of take a step back and say, well, maybe your funnel stages are wrong. Maybe you should rethink your business model. And that's kind of an also really interesting discussion. I like to see people that are willing to have both of those discussions as well. Now. Let's talk about the other, another question that I ask, which is like the website homepage question. And this is like a classic one. Um, I ask this one of people a lot. And what I like about this one is I've asked it of high school interns, and I've asked it of like potential like CMO level people. And it kind of never gets old as a question. And so um, I'll usually draw up, and this is kind of two snapshots of different parts of our website and different things that we've used over time, but I'll usually just have two like very different homepages that I'll drop on a whiteboard or something like that, and just ask people like which one should you pick, right? And it's interesting because like the really analytical people always zoom in on like, well, it, you don't know what the answer is, you should do A-B testing, right? And then the really brand-centric people always say, well, 
that headline implies that there's a lot more trust and it's sort of more you know, customer centric, so you should pick that one. And I feel like actually both of those answers are wrong. So I like to see people take a step back and say, well, what's the purpose of your homepage? Like, what are you trying to, you know, what are you trying to figure out, right? If you're Amazon, everyone in the world knows who you are and what you do. So you're just trying to get them deeper into the site to the thing that they're trying to find. Maybe showcase something they don't know about. But if you're a startup, and most of us work at small companies that don't have a giant brand yet, you're, the first thing your website needs to accomplish is explain to people who the heck you actually are, right, and what you do. And I think a lot of people sort of forget that, and this drive toward more and more conversions and drive more and more people down to the funnel, they sort of forget the idea that in the beginning, you need to help p people figure out what your company actually does. So I like people that can go down both of those paths, sometimes counterbalance between the two. Sometimes I'll ask people like, well, what if you get a 20% higher conversion rate by the result of an A-B test, but that page doesn't explain to people as well what the company does? And then you kind of set up a debate between the two and it's like, oh, like which one do you pick? I usually feel like explaining what the company does is worth giving up a fair amount of conversion rate for, but that's me. Um, cool, all right. So now we've found all these awesome, we know who we're trying to hire. We found some awesome people to hire. We've interviewed them. They passed through the interview process. Now we've hired them. Now the question is, how do you organize them? And I feel like the one big piece of advice here is that almost all companies over-invest in marketing in the bottom of the funnel. The reason that this happens is that, I'm going to call you out, Donlin. So Dave Donlin here, a fantastic sales leader that I've worked with for a number of years. Um, sales reps, the good ones, like Dave, are very demanding and they're very persistent, right? That's why we hire them. If you're hiring sales reps that are not demanding and not persistent, then guess what? You're probably not hiring very good sales reps. So you have all these sales reps, even if you're a small company, you have three or four of them, and the thing that they're always gonna be asking marketing for is like help in closing deals. So it's typically gonna be like product marketing and like other like things like that. So it's gonna be you know, better um, presentation materials, more case studies, um, things that explain like other details of the product, maybe even like some contract stuff and some pr proposal things, things like that. And because they're the only ones, not the only ones, they're one of the major constituencies in the companies asking you for things, you tend to listen to them more than you actually should. Because the problem is at the top of the funnel, it's the market is asking you for things. The market is asking you to reach out to them and help them explain what you actually do, how you can solve their problems. But they don't know that you exist, so they're not in your office bugging you every single day the way a great sales rep is. So most companies tend to overhire at the bottom of the funnel and don't hire nearly enough at the top. And so in teams that I've built over the years, I've tended to try to correct that by hiring more people so if you set up your marketing team by the stage of the funnel, and you have a team that's in charge of attracting people to your company, a team that's in charge of sort of the middle of the funnel around conversion, and another team that's in charge of working with the sales team, product marketing, sales enablement around closing, I tend to try to overhire on the attract portion of the funnel because there's no, like the sales team is gonna try to get you to overhire at the bottom. And so it's to try to like counteract that. The second reason is that if you have more people coming to your website, more people engaging with your company, that type of activity solves almost all challenges, right? So it's like, if you have more leads, you have more opportunities, it gives you more room to experiment, you learn more about your customers, you're having more good conversations, and on top of all of that, the sales team's complaining less because they got more fish in their barrel that they're trying to close deals from. So as a marketing team, you need to think like a little bit bigger picture, a little bit longer term, and focus on that very top of the funnel. So even at a team of like 18 or 20 people, I would typically try to have like half of that team focus on getting your, building your brands, getting more people to your site, having more content, um, you know, more inbound, more, more, just more flow into the business. And I'll give you an example here, and we're not quite living up to it, but we've got about a third of the team focused on it here at Cyber Reason, of where uh, between our track team, which is our content team, conversion and closing, uh, we do have a predominant amount of the resources in like the front two stages of the funnel, right? Uh, and so this is how I've set things up uh, there. So um, I have had a lot of fun here. It's getting warm in this room, right? A little bit warm, yeah. I'm like, I, I hate to actually look down and see how sweaty I am. I, don't, I think I pulled that off okay. Uh, but it's been a lot of fun talking to all of you. I'm gonna hang out for a little bit and then I'll be back for cocktails later. I'd love to connect with a ton of you. There's a bunch of old friends in the room. Thank you very much, it's been great, thank you.